everybody, and I'm sorry I have my back to some of you. You're all my <laughs> Welcome to the Cape Elizabeth uh, School Board Budget Workshop on Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. I'm going to hand it over to our finance chair, Jen McVeigh. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming earlier to accommodate the, um, the band concert tonight. <clears throat> I know Phil's very appreciative. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with the school board budget goals, which are to meet the academic, social, emotional, and health needs of all students, support the recruitment and retention of high quality personnel, supports appropriate and ongoing building maintenance and repair, supports the advancement of instructional skills of our staff, reflects a careful consideration of the effectiveness and efficiency of each line item and position, and strives for clear, transparent, and regular communication with the public throughout the budget process. Our agenda today will be to start with public comments. I don't know if we have anyone here from the public. I don't see anyone. And then uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris to review any additional questions. I think there's only one. Um, a state funding review uh, on EB 279, an update on the health insurance, a fund balance review, strategies to increase the CIP budget, and board member support of the budget. So, Michelle, I think I'm going to quickly turn it over to you. I think the only question on the Q&A is in regards to the ELA strategist and how that's going to interface with the proposed reading specialist. How, how will they interface and how will they differ? I'm going to ask Ryan to come up. Perfect. And then come up. <laughs> so, yeah, the design of this is the new position is to work with the ELA strategist and manage the strategist that's already um, on board and being funded through the budget. Uh, this position would just expand our ability to provide um, a comprehensive uh, ELA program for all our students in the regular classroom or in need of more intensive support. But, yeah, and to provide some uh, cohesion in terms of the uh, uh, MTSS process for literacy. So what happens in Tier 1 instruction, working in coordination with, the, with, with those individuals? What happens in Tier 2? And then this position, really working in Tier 3 in the intersection with the special ed. So we have a good cohesion moving from regular instruction to more support, to even more support to specially designed instruction. And what does that sequence look like? And then how do we support kids' consistency uh, throughout the board. So in terms of, you know, having an integration of, of programming, tier one programming, and what special design instruction looks like. So really working in collaboration um, and providing that uh, support in that tier three and working more specifically with tier three and special ed folks, but having that alignment across the board. And there, <clears throat> just to kind of sort of follow up on that after sure. reading your response, Michelle, there's also sort of that the position you have will be working to do some PD within special education and at the interventionist level where the PD that you're talking about, the LA strategist, tends to be more within that general education setting with teachers and things like that, right? Okay, thank you. I just wanted yes. to make that distinction. Yes. May I jump in just because I think MTSS is a new acronym and we just, I think everybody just started getting used to RTI and now we're throwing that one out for the public. And since I just learned about this like last meeting, can you talk? Sure. What is yeah, it's a new acronym for sure. So it's multiple, <laughs> multi-tier systems of support. So I think when we think about RTI, I think the focus was really much around academic, where multiple tier systems of support is um, expanded to also behavioral, social, emotional, emotional, physical health, and how do we meet all the needs for those students, and how do we do that simultaneously up and down that model. So it could start in special ed, it could start in the tier one world. Um, so that's what that means. And so we're wanting to get some really clarity around the inter reading intervention, because I think the public's been asking for that. Um, and then what does that look like in, in tier one? How do we support the, that folks in terms of what we pick for curriculum and how all that piece is. But when we get into this new position, it's really focusing on those students that really need that um, really explicit instruction and how do we provide that for folks? How do we make clarity in that system? And then how do we support and train them? So not just give them training, but support them, give them coaching, modeling, and then provide that. So I think it's unique. I think we'll be the only district, really, that um, that provides this level of specificity uh, in the surrounding area. There are there are school districts that you know have people trained in particular programs, but I liken it to putting one finger in a dam. 
So when you get you take the finger out, put it over here. Well, if all of our special educators can do that, our interventionist, and you got five fingers, you got a lot of holes. You train people constantly. Plug them. The follow up on the MTSS, it really allows us to look at the full spectrum. Tier one, but also our students, all of our students who have unique needs, and it might be that they're tangled learners or they're accelerated learners. So that's what the next move for an MTSS model here in this district just makes very good sense. Thank you. Well, my turn to get over to for the state funding review. Mr. Rosie Marcy. Up. <laughs> nice to see all of you. It seems like it's been a while. Um, I've had to miss a few budget workshops, but I think tonight um, we'll be able to tie it all together, give you a really good picture of where we are as a, as a district moving forward. So I'm going to talk about EPS, uh, the state funding formula, what it means for us for the coming year. Uh, a little bit, Marcy's going to talk more about fund balance and how we're going to utilize that. Uh, so what is EPS, and for all of you actually that are here tonight, this is kind of repeat, um, but we'll, we'll go through it anyway for the public uh, and refresh your memory. So EPS is a formula um, that provides a minimum funding level uh, for achieving the state learning results in, in an equitable way, really, um, to distribute state funding across the state between all the communities. And it's how do you balance what you offer locally to fund the budget and what does the state provide. So it's really a formula to help drive that. Um, and it's really aims to split the funding pie equitably between all the communities in Maine that have various tax bases. So that's the aim of it. And it's really important to remember though it's an adequacy model and not an excellence model. It's driving towards uh, meeting the minimum standards and not going above them. Um, so it accounts for uh, school district characteristics of students, um, so our, our student population, disadvantaged students and staff characteristics such as staff experience and education level. It also accounts for transportation, special education, debt service, and GT costs. Um, at, at the end, it determines the share of costs between the school district taxpayers and the state. So that's the model. And it comes out on the EV279 report, which we usually get uh, in late January. What it's not, and this is probably more important than what it is, uh, it is not a prescription for how money should be spent in the school district. So the state isn't telling us, the board, or, or myself, or um, administrators, how to spend the money. It is not the decisive amount of money that should be spent on education in the community. That's a local decision. So how much to budget on education, we decide locally here, the board, town council, the voters, so we decide and how we uh, spend that, spend those funds or allocate those funds is also a little bit soon. So what does our ED 279 report say this year? Um, so according to the report we received mid-January, uh, we need to budget a minimum of $21 million and some change to just minimally meet the uh, needs of our students. In order to receive the state share of uh, uh, $3.3 .3 million locally, we need to budget a minimum of about $17 million or $17.6. So in order to get the state amount locally, you have to raise a certain amount. That's how it works. Um, and our local share this year is actually 84%, um, which is a little less than last year. So that's a good thing. Uh, last year, the state contributed around $3 million. So we've gone up uh, almost $350 million from state funding, which is really great. Um, that's good news. Um, go ahead. $350,000. What I say, million? Yeah. Oh, that'd be really great. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't want that to be recorded. I, yeah, $350,000, $3 wow. We'd have better snacks. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, we'd have pretty good snacks. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean that, Robin. <laughs> Just a joke. Great snacks. Uh, $350,000. Um, and where does that come from? Uh, it's mostly because the higher state valuation. Um, so that um, lowered the lower the local mill rate we need to raise. So as the state valuation goes up, it, it lowers the local mill rate what we need to raise. It also is due to uh, 
an increase from special education, uh, also gifted and talented. Um, so we receive more money in those areas. So that's what drove up to getting the 350,000, not 350,000. <laughs> so this shows the history here. Um, and Elizabeth and, and Heather will know this well, kind of historically where we were. Um, and there was a cliff almost in 2018-19, and it's gradually built back up. Um, and how this moves around obviously impacts what we need to raise locally. So you can see um, we're about where we were in 2015-16. Um, of course, with inflationary dollars, that those dollars aren't valuable now, but we sure are great, grateful to have that kind of support from the state. So our aim in Cape Elizabeth, and you know this as well as anyone, is to exceed the state benchmarks, not just meet them. So EPS is it's built on meeting, not exceeding. Um, so our aim is to exceed. So exceeding the standards is really beyond the purpose of EPS. And how do we do that? How do we achieve above the standards, which is really our hope, our purpose, our mission? Um, we have lower student to teacher ratios which is similar to other high achieving districts. I'll show you that in a minute. A uh, vast majority of our students take four years of science, math, and world language. In fact, we have a K-12 world language program, which is very unique. Um, and of course, that has more cost. It's helping our students achieve at a higher level. We have an extensive AP course offerings, um, which are not covered by EPS. So that's a, we have to fund those locally. Um, but I'm sure it is well worth it for our students. And other classes advance beyond the standard, as you all know, pre-cal, computer programming, advanced art, and music classes, extended learning opportunities, and, and many, many, many others. And of course, we have staff to support student academic, social, emotional, and health needs. So all of that matters, and all of that requires locally we raise more than EPS would suggest we would. And of course, we have the Achievement Center and other supports within the district as well. So this is the front page of uh, our uh, EB279. I'm not going to go by every line, um, but basically it's all about ratios. Um, the EPS formula looks at what they would recommend for the minimum standard, to meet the minimum standard, and then we kind of compare what we have uh, to exceed the standard. And all of this leads to five or six pages, Mars said, think of calculations that finally leads to what we get uh, from the state and what we have to raise locally. And we can certainly talk about this all at another time and go into depth. Um, I think you're all familiar with, with the ratios and the calculations. So student-teacher ratio comparisons. Um, and you're familiar with this study. Really important one. Uh, but 78% of all Maine uh, high schools are below the EPS funding formula student-teacher ratio of 16 to 1. So that's nearly 80% of high schools choose to add more teachers uh, to offer more to their students. The average actual student-teacher ratio remains low poverty in high-performing schools, which CAPE is one, among others, is 13 to 1. Our proposed budget for next year has a ratio of 12.5 to 1 at the high school, which is equal to or higher than Greeley's, Yarmouth, Kennebunks, Falmouth, York's, and other high-performing New England high schools. So how do we compare to some of our neighbors, uh, which we, we often do? We, we have actually a little bit higher ratio. You can see that here, um, 10 to 1 in many of them, 11 to 1, uh, 12 to 1 in a few, and 13 to 1 uh, in some in Massachusetts. So uh, we are doing what other high-performing schools are doing. We're choosing to um, raise uh, funds really to support our really uh, achieving well above the standard, which I think is what we're all about. And um, then we're in good company. You can see here another way to look at this is percent over EPS. And you can see Yarmouth, South Portland, Scarborough, Falmouth, and Cumberland all there, um, and where we align, um, right in line with all these other districts. What this basically means is EPS funds 78% of our teachers. And what we do locally is fund above that. And that's exactly what these other districts are choosing to do as well. We're in good company. So, if we were to follow the EPS model and just aim for adequacy, the bare minimum, um, we would have to reduce. This is just at the high school. We would have to do the same thing at the middle school in Palm Cove. Um, 
We'd have to reduce seven and a half teachers. Um, this, of course, would have to lead to increasing class sizes, increasing uh, teacher load, uh, and reduce our offerings. So all the great classes that we offer here, we'd have to remove many of them. We'd have to remove one and a half administrators. Can you imagine running a school uh, such as this, with one and a half less administrators? Uh, half a librarian, half a nurse, one and a half of our great admin assistants would have to go. A social worker, we'd have to close the Achievement Center. Um, we'd have to eliminate academic supports and Freshman Academy, reduce professional development, <coughs> and reduce our extracurricular program. So to meet ad adequacy, we would have to reduce a lot. I don't support that. I don't believe you do either. Um, certainly, we've seen year after year the public has supported keeping our approach to education. So in summary, the EPS formula is not a formula for creating and or sustaining an excellent school district. It's not about that. It's the bare minimum. It's adequacy. It's really driven to equitably distribute state funding to help all communities across the state to meet the minimum standard. As you all know, every community has its challenges in the state, um, and some communities have some advantages, and that's how the calculations work to try to make it as equal as it can be. Following the formula for budgeting purposes would lead to substantial K-12 staffing and programming cuts and make it impossible to maintain let alone advanced student academic social emotional excellence that Kate is known for. The DLT supports the budget we presented to continue to support excellence in education for Cape students. So this is a very quick summary of EPS. I hope it gave you some fundamental understanding. I know all of you six have heard this many times before. But our aim really is to provide the very best education for all of our students variety of needs, um, and we need to raise more funds than the EPSS, uh, which should be adequate. So happy to answer any questions about this. We good? All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What's next? <coughs> uh, the health in New Zealand. For yes. Insurance? and the state versus what we were allocated? All right, so uh, it was, what, <coughs> two weeks ago, um, we got the ceiling, and it was higher than we were hoping for. Uh, it was 11 and a half, mm -hmm. that's right, Carson. Yep. Um, and they told us at that time, um, it's 11 and a half, and we'll try to get you what you have locally by April 10th. And we're like, oh, that's not helpful. Um, mm -hmm but they actually sent it to us this morning. Um, I was going to say, are we going to have to vote on a budget without knowing? I know, that's what we were worried about, right? <clears throat> um, but we were able to find out this morning, Marcy received it, and her team, Marcy, did quick calculations, and it's actually 9.55%, which is a significant increase. Um, but luckily, or not luckily, we did it intentionally, uh, we budgeted 10%, um, so it came right under, came right under 10%. Um, it's not what we were hoping for, um, but we continue to have higher loss ratios. Um, then we're not profitable, basically, to the insurance company. Um, so that causes us to have a higher increase. So we are pleased we budgeted for it, um, but it's not the savings we we're hoping. So that's about $24,000. Um, we, Marcy and I talked about it today. We think it's wise to keep that in the budget because uh, as we hire new employees, they may pick the uh, family insurance plan and that, that comes in uh, at a significant cost. So uh, we think we should keep it at $24,000 in the budget. So Marcy, did I miss anything? That's no, perfect. 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 How about that? Any questions? Um, we are thinking next year, so it's not a surprise. Um, we'll probably have to budget more than 10%. Um, some districts found out today they're having to pay 11.5%. Um, and it probably will continue to escalate. So uh, we'll have to make plans for that in the next budget. RC and I are the only people that like to talk about next year's budget. <laughs> right. We're already paying. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so that's state funding. That's the health insurance. Uh, move on to fund balance. Uh, Marcy, do you want to talk for a little bit? Sure. Um, great. I have a packet in front of you guys, and it's also posted online for those of you that are watching at home. And in your packet, I just wanted to give you a brief um, overview of what you have before we dive into fund balance. And I know Dr. Rook is going to talk about this. We have our budget changes worksheet. We have our Elizabeth spreadsheet, tax impact spreadsheet. We have our debt retirement graph. <coughs> After that, we have our fund balance section. <coughs> so we are ready to dive into the very first page that's fund balance 101. So for anybody who's, I know everyone here has been hearing this several years, but anyone at home who's wanting to know what definitions are, we've defined the term budgeted fund balance. That's the amount that the board approves every year to use to balance the budget. And the intent is to decide how much of the funding can be used from fund balance to decrease the property to tax impact to taxpayers. So that's that, the intent for the term budgeted fund balance. Unassigned fund balance. This is exactly what it says. It's unassigned and it represents the amount that is, that is amassed in our fund, but we cannot use it during the year by state statute. So it's fund balance that has accumulated, but we can't touch it unless we budget it for it. Projected carryover. That's the amount that we keep our eye on every year when we're talking about our monthly financials and we talk about the percentage point where we are. We're talking all the time about if our revenues will come over what we plan, what we have planned and will the expenditures come under. The combination of the two become a projected carryover, hopefully. In, in some cases there will be a little, in some cases there might be exactly what we budgeted. But that's the projected carryover amount. The state allowance, we've defined one more year, the state will allow school departments to carry a 9% fund balance, unassigned. So we still have one more year, and for us that would mean 3,075,000 at this time. After that, they'll resume to the 5%, which by the way, that's good because it used to be 3%. They increased it to 5%, recognizing the need schools to plan for emergencies that happen in the future and they recognize the need to have a healthy fund balance to keep so they raise it to five percent our auditors recommendation and I don't know if you've also heard the presentations from our town financial advisor who quoted nine percent for a healthy fund balance our auditors like between three to five percent and nine percent is what a a municipality should be carrying if they're allowed to carry that much downside. So I wanted to include that amount just to show the range. A healthy range is between 3 to 9 percent. And we are right now with our proposed budget landing at a projection of a 6 percent by next year, which we're still within the state requirements. So that's, so that's good. So those are the definitions for Fund Balance 101. The next page relates to our audited fund balance as of June 30th, 2023. Also, April 23rd, I believe, is the presentation from our auditors. I want to just mention that, that our auditors will be explaining our, our audited financial statements on that night. But this is the number that we pull from that. So we always are paying attention to this. By June 30th, and then we watch it throughout the summer as the audit progresses to see where we're going to be for our audit amount. So for this year, we had the three, three million two hundred and one thousand three hundred sixty-five. So we have budgeted five hundred thousand this fiscal year. By next, by June 30th, potentially the projection will be two point seven at this time. And again, the next, the middle box outlines our 9% number and the 5% number from the state. 
So at the very bottom, you can see that our projection for even the following year, we're still we're at that 6% number of the 2,051,000. Now, what we've done, the work Dr. Rucker has um, had the vision for the next two, thank you, Chris, the next two pages, the vision that Dr. Rucker had was us providing, looking backwards at our previous projections, looking at our present day, and also looking forward and forward by two years right now. So these graphs and this chart represents where we, we analyze where we were, what did we project, how did we come in by year end with based on our projections, how close are we getting to our projections, are we on target, where we are with the current year, so uh, the, the plan for the current year for fiscal year 25, the 650,000 plan for fund balance, and then we've even included what we think we should have as a goal for next year, for fiscal year 26. So we're always going to be past, present, and hopefully two to three years out for future. Mm -hmm. The graph that this shows, I think this, that's exactly where we want to be, and we're even hoping that our two year out, we're hoping that those blue, the blue line where we start right here, we're hoping that actually will land a little bit straight down even. But we know we have to we have to plan on exact budgets, very little carryover, and see where we are, and know that that will be still a fiscally sound position by fiscal year 26. The last page shows the graph of the change of the use of fund balance. And again, this shows how every year the intentional plan by the school board budget process to reduce the impact on property taxes based on what was happening, whatever was happening with a loss in state subsidy, increased expenditures, you can see how it was intentional at every year how to decrease the impact, but still maintaining a healthy fund balance in case anything happens going into the following year. I would say in summary, right now, I feel like this is a very, uh, this is a fiscally sound position that we're in, and uh, I, I would be able to say confidently that you should feel very good about your fund balance position and your use of fund balance of what is projected for this year to keep a good in, a reduction to the property taxes as much as possible. But still keeping that intent to keep a healthy fund balance <coughs> for the future. You can see why that, <coughs> excuse me, why that's so important. In the yeah. FY18, that's when, around the time, Cape was losing funding. Fund balance needed to come into play. We, this tells the story of the district in many ways. So any questions, and you'll see the final big picture of what 600, applying $650,000 of fund balance will do to the tax rate in a few minutes. So Go I ahead. just want to thank you for this presentation because I think it's really important to um, kind of juxtapose our ability to use fund balance with how the town can use their fund balance. We've had different discussions, and this tells a really great story. I like this chart. This graph is great. Um, but the town side has a fund balance that they're able to tap into throughout the year. The school has this, and we're allowed to touch it once, and that's it. And so it's it's not really the same as having a contingency. It's, it's a very kind of purposeful, sort of planning ahead kind of <coughs> contingency, but it's not a true, it's sort of like, this is what we can do, and then we hope for the next year. And, and so I, I, I think it's really important for the public to understand this, and I think it's important for town council too, that we don't get to dip back into this. We, we cannot expend it. more than the voters <coughs> allow us to expect. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, 
quick question on the uh, projections. So it seems like I saw that we, we obviously project what this fund balance will be at the end of the year, but when you put it in the act, knowing actual we have shows quite a big increase that this past year, about a million, 1.1 million, um, that it actually we ended up with after you take into consideration excess revenues and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, monies that we didn't spend. I'm wondering if you're going to, I see you just carried forward, forward our projection here, if we're going to have something similar, because I'm just, I'm conscious of the fact we're going to have to be at 5% next year, which obviously we could use a lot of it and get yeah. down and that will, you know, help the budget next year. But I'm wondering if it's yeah. worth thinking about that. I don't think this year. we've had these conversations and when we came out of the COVID years, we were yeah. able to accumulate that kind of savings, but I don't think that we're okay. seeing that. And we are also to get to where we are with our expenditure percentages, we've had to make sure everything is just as much as fine um, to the point with every budget line. So I don't okay. think we will though. We'll be much off projections. Right. And if so we'll just have to, <laughs> we'll have to use more of it. Exactly. And if so, there <laughs> there will be several options that Dr. Red has intention of talking about I, you know, using more for fund balance, capital reserve funds, that kind of thing. Yes. Those are always options. We have been talking about creating a capital reserve fund. <clears throat> so we haven't talked about it, but we've been talking about it. And clearly, a building needs. So mm -hmm. That may be a way to apply some of yeah. those funds. Is that on the agenda? Is it? it is not. Okay, but it's gonna, certainly. So I was going to wait. Yeah. Um, that's a question, actually. A resident asked me. Which is, you know, could we start to, you know, have a capital reserve fund like municipalities can? I actually didn't know the answer to that. I knew we were limited. What I said, I knew we were limited on our fund balance, but I didn't know if we could have a separate capital group program to And if that's regulated in any way, are we also limited? And it's separate from the percentage that the state counts as the unreserved. So okay. it's, it does not fall under that 5% legal requirement. Okay. So we could have a separate fund that we're putting yes. money aside, unlimited, essentially, for a particular capital project. Or projects, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. We would just have a budget for that, I assume. We'd, we'd yes. have to find it, raise that amount of money. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions? Thank you, Marcy. And you gave me way too much credit during that. It's your vision, Doctor. Uh, you were part of this. Every day we talk about it. <laughs> Every <It's> day. <laughs> Michelle hears it. It shuts her door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. What's next? Uh, strategies to increase the capital improvement budget. So this sort of connects to what yeah. you were saying, Phil. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what we think is wise to do this year. Um, so our intention um, all along was to find a way to increase from $500,000, which we know is not enough. Um, Dave did a nice job of presenting. Year after year, we are below where we should be. Um, we're not going to get to where we probably should be, but we determined how do we start increasing SIP so we can take care of our buildings um, every year uh, because they're all aging. Um, and no matter what the referendum is uh, in November, uh, our buildings will still have needs. So I can tell the story of the budget and then show you how we figured out how to add $200,000 to, to SIPs. So when we began, uh, way back in January, this is where we were, the budget request, 4.13% uh, expenditure increase, and we projected a 3.44% uh, property tax increase. Going forward, uh, we were able to eliminate a vacant psychologist position uh, and move that to contracted services um, pay for out of local entitlement um, and that enabled us to lower our expenditure amount um, and lower the impact on taxes uh, we found out the ceiling on health insurance uh, that was last week and we were like oh no um, or said something like that um, <laughs> and we're trying to figure out how, where this would go and we're hoping we find out and we did today, thank goodness. Because um, at that time we were talking about, well, if health insurance comes in lower than we projected, could we move some of those funds over to SIPs? Um, that was our initial plan. We we're like, oh, that's not going to happen. So what can we do? Um, 
around that same time, um, we decided to increase um, uh, our use of unassigned fund balance from half a million to 650,000. Um, that helped reduce the impact on the taxpayers down to 2.51, uh, which is really incredible um, considering uh, what this budget's gonna do for students and staff. Um, and then uh, we were still trying to strategize, how do we increase SIPs? And so thing came, all came to fruition over the last few weeks for us. Because um, of Dave's uh, great work and Marcy's um, with the LED lighting, solar farm, we're going to be able to lower our electricity um, budget or shift that money, reallocate that by $37,000. We thought that would flow nicely over to the CIP. Uh, we realized we did not need to fund, as we initially thought, uh, for paid family and medical leave uh, this year, because we were going to have to pay one or half, to at least half a percent or one percent uh, of paid family leave. Um, and we realized really recently from Drummond and Woodson that we did not have to, so that was $103,000. Uh, we determined to move that over to CIP. Uh, and we solidified uh, through our work with the board uh, that we were going to keep uh, the mindfulness facilitator that position at part-time. So that had, was another $60,000 uh, that we had originally put in the budget. So that got us up to $200,000 uh, that we determined SIPs, obviously, that's your decision, but we would recommend that. Um, that gives us, you know, another $200,000 to take care of our building needs. Um, we were able to do that without increasing the budget. The budget is still at 3.74% expenditure increase, which is lowest or second to lowest in Cumberland County. Uh, most districts are coming in, and they all face challenges. We were in this boat last year, they're facing it now. They're in the six, seven, eight, and nine percent, um, which we had to do last year for a number of reasons, um, and that still brings us in at two point two point five one uh, percent tax increase, which is really low. Um, it's still an increase, and we understand that, but it's much lower than where we've been. Um, so we're really proud of that. So, doing all the things we're trying to do, adding some of the new positions to meet student needs certainly attracting and maintaining our great staff through our contracts, uh, increasing CIP, uh, address our building needs, and to come in with that amount, uh, I'm really proud of. So happy to get your feedback on whether you think that's the right thing to do with CIP. Um, and then that kind of moves Jen into the next question, uh, is the board comfortable with where the budget's at as we head into the vote next week? So maybe CIP first. We have a, I think we've talked about the list of the CIP projects. So, what we would be adding by adding $200,000? Um, Dave has, and Dave, you can come on up. Um, there's an extensive list from Harriman who we've been working with. Our needs, they've really looked, and we've done this at Building and Grounds, um, but they have a prioritized list zero to three, <coughs> year zero to three for repairs, and then year three to six. Um, it's very extensive. But Dave, can you talk a little bit about how this would help us? Yeah, so we have a pretty good list of projects. Um, what we really need to, a big, a big thing that's going to impact what we're going to work on is what building choice we go with, because there's really almost a different CIP priority list based on kind of the three choices. Mm -hmm. So like if they were to do the new middle school, you know, maybe we're focusing more on elementary school and the high school. Um, so uh, as we kind of narrow that down, we're going to be able to tighten it up a little bit. And we'll be able to give you a detailed list. And okay. that'd be nice, I think, for the public too to in the future see the project, see it when it gets completed. Um, that said, even with a seven hundred thousand dollar increase, there are some huge items out there that could take up three hundred K in one big chunk if we wanted to be aggressive on some of these things. So um, it's awesome to see it increase, but um, we're still working it through and hopefully um, I'm talking with the owner's reps tomorrow. We're going to kind of try to tighten up the list a little bit more. Okay, thanks. So for the before you vote next week, we'll give you some more detail. On that. Okay. okay. Cindy. A question too on um, the CIP. What about like a unforeseen emergency repair? Say something 
So if we had something catastrophic happen and we don't have the funds for it, we would go to the town because um, they have a fund balance that they could actually choose to help us. So we'd have to go to town council, present this as a situation, and we need the funds. We've also had uh, things happen where uh, we had a planned CIP project that maybe you know wasn't as as urgent as other things, and we what's happened. This has happened a lot actually. Is so we had a plan to do something, but then uh, pipe burst, and then we put that money towards that, and then that project keeps getting delayed. And I think that's actually been going on for a long time in this district. Is um, the CIP kind of money gets reallocated, um, which is a pain in the butt. That's that's where I was going. Is that Allocating the reaching to CIP, mm -hmm. are we able to plan, or are we really reactive to emergencies? I, it's both. I have an answer, but Dave, this is your. Yeah, one. I mean, we're we're, we're pretty. Uh, I mean, we're, we're pretty reactive. I mean, we're at this point where like we're just waiting for things to break and then we fix them. And all like the long term strategic planning doesn't even work right now. Like at the middle school and elementary school, everything's past its lifespan. So it's it's really we're in a tough spot the high school's slightly better um but yeah we, we really it's hard to make any good planning on, on any of this with the situation we are right now um and then one other thing i just wanted to add i'm gonna, I'm gonna put in my my work my write-up for you guys for this school board meeting um the led lighting might even be even greater than i put in here this was a conservative number and um because we still only have a few months of both schools with the led so there, this might be additional money that we can put towards CIP um, as we see the savings come in. And we also secured a really amazing electricity rate that's going to start the second half of the year. It, uh, it's like a 34% reduction on the kilowatt um, rate. It's, it's still a delivery cost, which is bad. But, um, so we might have even more money towards the CIP, uh, which is really awesome news. So my answer to that is similar to Dave's. I think we are responding to um, no fault of Dave um, or any of you. It's just aging buildings that are having real needs. And I think the referendum will hopefully find a solution that can provide some funds. Um, but that's still um, years out, really. So we, we need some more funds, really, to keep these buildings functional. And this, I wish we had more. You know, Seven hundred thousand is a move in the right direction, but as Dave presented, we need more, more you know, within the millions uh, to really take care of our schools. I think we have to have balance that with the political realities. And then just one last thing to add on that: as I'm thinking here in my head, um, because of a lot of the reporting that we have now, too, uh, we are going to be able to go after some state funding with the SRF. Um, and they rate um, ventilation stuff as like tier one things. And I believe it's two million per building. You know, not guaranteed that, but um, you know we're gonna hopefully get something good in November, and then also make aggressive moves to you know capitalize on those funds as well to make improvements. I do want to applaud you for you know, Marcy, for all of your efforts seeking out grants and state funding and using that money appropriately thinking about what can we carry over if new buildings are approved what is imminent now versus what can we you put a lot of thought and effort into this certain thing all right um there's no more comments there i, I think it'd be really helpful for us to hear your comfort this isn't a vote um, but your comfort with the, with the budget as it is. Um, as a reminder, this began back in October. Um, and a long process of our great district leadership team working with our staff building the budget, collaborating with Marcy, um, then meeting with me in December, um, DLT deciding as a group what the budget was going to look like. We presented the DLT budget to you in January. Uh, we've met a few times since then. We answered I don't know, 50 questions in that document probably. Um, we learned what the state was going to fund. Um, we learned what our insurance ceiling was and our final insurance number. Uh, we determined how to um, really meet the needs of our students and staff with this budget and 
three steps. So um, you're voting next week. So if you're seeing something that you wish was different, it would be great to know that now. Or you think it's fantastic, that would be great to know. <laughs> My other question, Please. and this is just ignorance possibly on my part, but we, on March 26th, you have it at 3.74%, but, you know, the actual increase would be 3%. And then the next line down is at the same um, value, 3.74, but now the change is to 2.51. Right. Can you kind of just yeah. explain that? A that bit? That's the application of fund balance. Okay. So what we had up here, good question. 326, we own, we're applying 500,000 to fund balance. So when you apply fund balance, that reduces the amount needed to be raised locally on taxes. So we increase that to 650,000. So thus you can see the tax impact went from 3% to 2.51%. Because the budget doesn't change. But we no, we're to still expending it. the same amount, but where we're how much we're using for fund balance to offset taxes. But it's, I get it. It's all a bunch of different levers and how it all works. Kathleen, you were about to say something. Um, yeah, oh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I, you know, this is, I guess I've been through this um, the least number of times, you know, relative to other board members, but each time we've gone through the budget process, I've learned so much about the district. Um, and and the complexity of running it and all of the work that the district leadership team puts into this is really, it's its stunning and informative and, and it, this is only my third time, but it's so different from year to year and I know that they went into it this year um, cognizant of the, the bigger landscape that the town is in and, and especially the discussion around the referendum. Um, and so I can appreciate how challenging it must have been to bring this budget that was really tight and, and relative you know, to what I've seen in the last couple of years. And, and so also very interesting to hear your comments about where we stand relative to other peer communities. Um, but I, from the initial presentation, I, I thought this budget was, was really smart, was thoughtful. Um, and I'm delighted that we're able to offer the town something that's in the low single digits. I think that's really um, it's such a testament to the work that the team has been putting in um, and, and really still holding on to the qualities um, of our education that we, we all value. That we talk about. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the work that everybody's put in. I think it's, um, I think it's really solid and really strong. I know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I agree with what Kathleen said. I think it was very thoughtful. I appreciate the time that you always take to walk us through all of the steps and make sure we're understanding every every decision that's made and what's in the budget. And um, I'm amazed that it is able to um, come in with, with such a Thanks. Um, I, of course, agree with what everybody else has said. Um, but I'd also like to go back to our goals. You know, before this started, we as a board came up with goals. And as I reread them and, you know, listen to all this thing going on with the budget, um, they're all met, um, at least to a degree. You know, I mean, I, I think that's, a, you know, I think to a very high degree myself, but, um, and, and to me that's a successful budget. Uh, when it's paired with the, the, the conscious impact of the taxpayers and, and trying to balance all of that um, and keeping it relatively low, in fact, one of the lowest that I've ever witnessed, um, tax impact of 2.51, um, I think is incredible, um, especially with the insurance coming back the way it did. Um, but I think you've met the goals, and um, that's our role, not to nitpick what you do. Um, but the process was, was excellent, um, and the goals are not, so I support it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thanks, Evan. Yeah, I do too. And I think um, I'm particularly impressed that it's such a low increase, but we met the goals. But I also think we ex we still moved it, moved the district forward. Sure. You made sort of targeted changes that you know you can have a lean budget year and not really make any positive impacts as a result, or you're, you're decreasing even. And I think I think it's a testament to what you guys have done that we actually are making some investments both in the buildings and in, and in our people that I think moves us forward, but at a really minimal impact. So I think that's a, I think it's a budget to be proud of. To be honest with you. Thanks, Phil. So it might be hard to go toward the end, but I, I feel like it's really nice to hear all this because I've lived through a lot of budgets. I've lived through some really lean years where we had to cut CIP and contemplate um, absorbing retirements and it's all, you know, it's can be really difficult. And I am particularly proud of this budget and I am so grateful to the work and the people that did this work. Um, and we a lot of times talk about um, the state funding formula being, you know, it's not a it's not a model for excellence. It's not, you know, it's sort of just your absolute baseline for kind of getting it done. But I also appreciate the thinking that that comes with okay but there are ways to use that to our advantage and going after very specific positions that we need that are going to impact learners at all parts of the spectrum but that also positively impact our budget that's the kind of thinking that we need and it's so I'm there have just been a lot of like little moments and little changes that have a big effect on this budget and um, I, I, I agree. I feel like we've met our goals. Um, I think we have also been very responsible to our taxpayers, our neighbors, and I'm proud to support this budget. Thank you. I really don't have anything else to add. I feel like if you summed it up nicely that we are, you know, actually setting money aside that we haven't set aside for the buildings as well as to support our students. So I. Um, as well. I would just be echoing what all of you said, so I'm going to fast. Very well, thank you for your kind words and for all the work of the BLT. Um, yeah, quite an achievement to get where we are. Um, thank you, Marcy. Probably done. And Robin, thank you for the great food. <laughs> My mother's going to watch this and smack me <laughs> being too flip. Um, but, uh, I think we built a great budget. We'll be proud to present uh, this to you next week uh, and have you vote on it um, with the public. So, any closing words? No, just the next year of town council will be presenting to town council on the 27th. Yes, April 22nd at 6 o'clock, um, we'll be presenting the budget. That will be followed up with Harriman giving you all and the town council an update on the building project option. Go so on. if I may, I, this can be in lieu of an email and any sort of back and forth, but we need to put that on our calendars. That is a Monday. It's not a typical um, school board night for us. And we're starting at 6 p.m. because it's sort of a 2 meeting night where we will present the budget and then Harriman will give us an update and then the, I believe it's the next night we have our audit which um, it's great for as many board members as can to attend it's a listening moment it's there you don't have to interact but it's really good to be there to hear and um, the school board portion typically doesn't take a super long time but that's two nights and it has been our tradition to count that as our workshop because it's two nights in that week that we would so I'm throwing that out there as a, a thought for people and for dates and times one more time. Yeah. April twenty second, six PM. Yeah. Town Council Chambers for the presentation and then the twenty third is six thirty. Mm -hmm. I thought they said 6 p.m. I thought they said 6 p.m. this morning. It says 6 on our, on our chart. Yeah. Right. And I will have the, our audited financial statements at our board meeting this coming Tuesday night. Oh, great. So, so we can, can review those. I may need 
to have us follow that audit presentation of a quick workshop. Mm -hmm. but I'll let you know. we'll talk mm -hmm. about That's fair. Not available to me. All right. Well, thank you all. Let's all right, go to a concert. Yeah, just that time. Stop yourself to take some.